Good morning, church. God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Should we sing it?
us with kindness. There is only one. He is our God. Oh, He is our God. Holy, you alone are holy. Master. join me in uh, as we lift up our voices in God to prayer. Let's begin by praying silently in adoration of God, praising God for who he is. From Psalm 95, 1 through 8. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is, is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are, all, are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And from Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Father, we praise you this morning for who you are. You are the creator of all the earth, the one true and sovereign God, all-knowing, loving, and just. Um, Confession. God's word tells us this about confession from uh, 1 John 1 through 1 verse 9. We confess our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. From Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, 
but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Let us, let's pray silently, confessing our sins to our loving and merciful God. Father, we have sinned against you. We have worshipped the things that you have created instead of you. We have pursued our own selfish desires rather than desiring you. Forgive us for our selfishness and give us a clean hearts that desire to honor you in our thoughts and our actions. Thanksgiving. Now let's express our gratitude to him for all he has done with prayers of thanksgiving. From Psalm 100, uh, 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to and his faithfulness to all generations. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus, sent into the world to rescue us by living the perfect life that we could not, paying our debt with his blood on a cross and forgiving our sins. Thank you, Father for the gift of your Holy Spirit who reveals your truth to us. And thank you, Father, for your loving grace and mercy. A supplication. Finally, let's submit our request to him in supplication, lifting the needs of others to our loving and merciful God. Psalm 91, 1 through 16. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Father, we pray for those that are suffering this morning from broken marriages, sickness, disease, anxiety, depression, loneliness, addiction, selfishness, and so many other painful realities of living in this broken world. We know that the only hope in this world is Jesus. We know that you are the only solution to our problems. We turn to you this morning and ask that you fill each of us with the desire to surrender and trust in you alone for all our needs. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing this with us. <laughs> My heart beats that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him. Yet I look for worldly treasure and 
forsake the King of kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer. Though I fall, his love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing I am his forever. is mine for Christ is mine forevermore. Oh, Christ is mine forevermore. 
Jesus, thank you for being our security. Thank you um, for being there in eternity for us. Um, we praise we praise you today. Uh, we, we praise you um, that you are the God of creation, that you are the God um, that has saved us, that you are the God we will rejoice together around forever. Uh, help us keep our eyes fixed on glory, on you as our reward and nothing else. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, look around and greet your neighbor this morning. Good morning, beloved of God. Okay, you're there. I have to warm you up a little bit more. You who are loved with a love that will never let you go. Right? Do you stand in that every day? That there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and nothing you've done would make him love you less. We just sang that. We just sang that. We're his forevermore. And so I hope you are learning as we all are learning to measure his love by the cross and his power by the resurrection not our circumstances but who this god is and what he's done for us in jesus that's the gospel well today we come to an end of our uh series our lengthy series about the holy spirit the promise of god and uh, this promise of god is just one of the many things that distinguishes Christianity from all other religions on the planet. God comes in those who place faith in Jesus. He's not just out there somewhere and we're trying to... Con he promises to indwell his people with his Holy Spirit, the promise. So we've been talking about that. We finish this today. And then uh, if you want to come back at noon for lunch... We'll have a, a panel and we'll do some question and answers about the Holy Spirit, which will be great fun. And there's going to be enough food for anybody. So if you didn't RSVP, don't let that stop you. Um, $10 for adults. Kids are free. Kids eat free. Uh, we're going to monitor some teenage boys, but kids eat free. And we can come back at noon for that. It'll be great. Our, our text today that we're uh, working from is John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21 primarily verse 16, but John chapter 14, so we're talking two-thirds of the way through the Bible into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you want to look it up on your device or in a Bible that's, that you brought with you, book form. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 21, which says, these are the words of Jesus, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So that's the verse we're going to focus on uh, primarily today. He will be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know, <coughs> excuse me, that I am the Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Let's pray again. Uh, I was reminded in Uganda that people don't talk about where they go to church, they talk about where they go to pray. So we're praying again. Uh, and uh, I want you to pray silently right where you're sitting and, and ask God to speak to you, which is the theme of our, 
our teaching today, God speaks. So ask him to speak to you. If that's a new thing, go ahead and give it a try. You play, pray silently, then I'll pray, and we'll take a look at this great truth, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise of words. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for the truth You've spoken and revealed to us already today in the prayer Steve led and the songs we've sung together. We praise you that you are the God who speaks. And we want to hear you now from your word. We're listening for your glory and for our joy. We say this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, many of you know that earlier this month, a few of us with connections to our network of churches here in the St. Croix Valley, myself included, went to Uganda uh, to do a taster event. It turns out there were 71 uh, pastors who came to that, representing 18 different people groups or tries, uh, tribes. And we went there to, to in the process of discerning if God is going to lead us to commit to another three years of training these pastors in Uganda, training them to interpret the Bible and preach biblical sermons and plant and lead churches grounded in biblical gospel, saturated truth. And many of you knew we were going, and many of the people in our network have been praying about this tremendous opportunity. Last fall, we thought that we would be meeting with a group of pastors from the Anglican Church of South Sudan. Their bishop, Kahuna Bishop guy, reached out and said, I've heard about what you're doing. My guys need this training. Can you do it? So we, we were praying about that for months and months and months. As we continued to move forward with that, we realized that God was not leading us in that direction. And at the same time, this other opportunity was like the, these people were crying out, here we are, <laughs> you know, lead and, and teach us. So, so we prayed about that. We've done some wise investigation. We prayed some more. And as you know, this training of pastors began in 2015 with doors that were opened by Tutapona, which is founded right here among you, Faith Community Church New Richmond. Doors were opened there, and we were able to train uh, since 2015 uh, more than 70 pastors who have planted dozens of churches. And this next time around, there'll be 71 pastors, uh, half of them being taught completely by teams of African teachers that we have trained. And so we ask God to give us guidance, and it sure seems like he has spoken. 71 guys showed up, and all 71 of them signed a three-year commitment to this training. That's a pretty, pretty powerful thing. Well, it's like, oh, I think that's God, you know. And followers of Jesus, we pray like that all the time, don't we? We ask God to speak into our life. We ask God to give us wisdom as we make decisions. We, we ask him to weigh in, to, to speak in some way. And I bet if you're a follower of Jesus, you've done that. Oh God, please, what should I do? Show me, teach me, speak to me. We ask for guidance on big stuff and day-to-day -day stuff. In her old, now old and helpful little book about the Holy Spirit entire, entitled The Helper, Catherine Marshall wrote, quote, Some of the Spirit's help is aimed at releasing us from many of the time-consuming details of daily life. Not to make us lazy, but, but so we can be free to take on more important tasks for Him and to help other people. Indeed, when we, when we allow the Spirit to move through us to the needs of others, we're going to be so busy as sorely to need the Spirit's very practical help, finding where to repair an important tool, locating a misplaced article, saving money here or there on food or clothing purchases, end quote. Catherine Marshall was writing about the Holy Spirit speaking to her in her daily life about small things and big things the helper, the helper, the God who speaks. Jesus said, as we just read, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. 
So the word that we have trans the words we've translated there, another helper, express really one word in the original language, the Greek language of the Bible, parakletos, the verbal adjective of parakleho. So for you grammar, grammar nuts, that's the thing for you. It's a ver verbal adjective here, I guess. And literally means to call alongside and encourage. Okay? In the secular Greek of Jesus' day, the word was used in a legal sense of an advocate who speaks for someone else. An advocate speaks for someone else. And so all of that influences the translation, and we can find several English words in different translations about this incredible idea of the Holy Spirit coming alongside, speaking on behalf of Jesus. And so you can find words like comforter and advocate and helper and counselor. And again, the context of Jesus' words here in John 14 was that an advocate, someone who would speak on his behalf, would be sent by him from heaven to be with his followers forever. The Holy Spirit, while we're living here on the planet, speaking on Jesus' behalf, to help us. In this teaching of Jesus in John 14, Jesus is announcing his return to heaven, his role of encouraging and strengthening and leading and guiding and, and teaching the disciples would be transferred now uh, to the courts of heaven. But Jesus' followers would not be alone. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Another counselor, one just like me, an advocate, a comforter, will come. Jesus will come in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will come speaking on Jesus' behalf. Words that will help and guide and strengthen his people. And we shouldn't be surprised by that at all if we paid any attention to the biblical story. Because the biblical story features a God who speaks. When we meet God in the very first chapter of the Bible, God is speaking. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. We meet God speaking. <laughs> Our God speaks, spoke universes into existence spoke the elements that form everything. He spoke them into existence. He spoke life in all of its great variety into existence. And when God created human beings, he spoke to them. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will die. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Our God speaks. He spoke to Noah, told him to build a boat, tells Abraham to leave the area where he is living, speaks to him, and go to a land that he will show him to start a new life and become a blessing for the whole world. He speaks to Moses and says, set my people free. Our God speaks. So in one way, the, uh, the one way to look at the Bible is as a, a record of God's conversations with his people. And I'm, and I'm sure somebody has counted, but the number has to be in the thousands of the times where some part of the Bible says, the Lord said. Ever notice that when you read the Bible? The Lord said, the Lord says, thus declares the Lord. And scholars even look at that and they call it a prophetic formula which the prophets of God proclaim God's word, thus saith the Lord, hear the word of the Lord, that kind of thing. Our God speaks. Our God is so committed to speaking that he spoke to over 40 different people from a great variety of walks of life over a span of 1,600 years to create this thing that we call the Bible. In fact, we sometimes refer to the Bible as what? The word of God. 
speaking to us. Our God speaks. So committed to speaking is our God that when the Son of God, Jesus, becomes incarnate, becomes a human to work God's salvation plan, He is referred to how? As the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Our God is all about speaking to His people. And so when Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, He promises an advocate one who will speak on his behalf to his people. And we ought not be surprised. And I know that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have experienced this kind of thing, where you have sensed God speaking, leading, guiding. Last week, Pastor Dave gave, a, gave an example of that from his own life when he said, there I am standing on the bridge, and I heard God say to me, Mary Brenda. I mean, that's a big one, but we've, we've sensed that, right? What Catherine Marshall and others have written about, not audible, but you hear the message in your soul. Sometimes it's words. Sometimes people have said, I've, I've seen this image, this vision, a lot of that going around these days, it seems like, uh, Words perhaps are easier to understand. Images have to be kind of what? Un interpreted and it's easier to get that wrong. But in your mind, in your spirit, you hear. God speaks. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the promised presence of God in us by His Holy Spirit is a promise of words. Sometimes we're asking. Sometimes He just speaks. And when we tune into the Holy Spirit, by that I mean when we when we ask the Holy Spirit to be our life, our source, our strength, our purpose, our power, we will notice His promptings. We will hear Him in the day-to-day -day of our, our life. And of course, the question then is, was that God or was that last night's pizza? Right? I mean, you're going, uh, what? What was that? Right? That's the truth of it. You wonder. Wonder. So how do we know if the impulse of the Holy Spirit, the impulse is, is the Holy Spirit speaking, guiding, or helping? Well, let me talk about that a little bit. First, we've got to filter all of these impulses and messages through the words of God that have been recorded in the Bible, in the Scriptures. The Bible is the measure in fact, that word canon of Scripture means measure. This is, this is what we know for absolute certainty has been spoken by God to His people. The Holy Spirit breathes out the Bible. He inspired it. It's God's Word. And so we use it to measure all other messages we might think come from the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will never tell us to do something that's going to contradict what's written in the Scriptures. Never. It will never happen. I think the Holy Spirit is leading me to do this. Well, the Bible verse says, don't do that. So that's not the Holy Spirit, okay? The, the, the Scriptures, and, 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 and that goes for images that someone might have or dreams or visions, again, which are being emphasized these days by some. If they're from God, they will be clearly, easily supported from the Scriptures. If they're vague or not in line with scriptural truth, they're not from God. He's never going to contradict what he has given us to measure the sound of his voice. So, the scriptures. Second, seek wise counsel from spiritually mature people. That's one of the reasons that God has ordained that there be elders shepherding his people to keep us hearing the gospel, to keep us from not listening to truth, not listening to the things that aren't true. Elders, they shepherd and help us discern God's voice in our life. They, they help us use the scriptures to evaluate whether or not we have heard from God. And so when you say, I, I think God might be saying this to me, a wise person can help you process that. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors to what some wise people say about that. 
Okay, just like Dave last week said, he didn't march up to Brenda and go, God says you're marrying me. I was like, that wouldn't be wisdom. Let's, let's see what other people say. That's the kind of, of heart that's being expressed uh, when the gathered church in Jerusalem is praying for God to give them guidance, and then they say this, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We were in counsel about this together. It seems like the Holy Spirit. That's what they did. Okay, third, if Scripture and wise people, including these shepherding elders, these shepherds in our life, if they don't confirm the words that you've heard or the vision that you've seen, be humble enough to say, okay, thanks. And keep listening because God speaks. <laughs> and maybe you missed that one. Maybe you missed it a little bit. Keep listening. We've had people leave Faith Community Church family because they have said, God has said this to us, and our elders said, ah. And they couldn't take that, the possibility that they might not have heard from God. And so they left. Let's have some humility with this business. Let's have humility and keep listening. Don't get defensive. Be humble. And if God has a message for us, he's going to get it through to us. Be humble. Be patient. The Holy Spirit is our helper who will speak to us on behalf of Jesus. So fourth, if the scripture and wise people confirm the message, step out in faith. Take a risk. <laughs> if it's a small thing, maybe it won't hurt so bad if you get it wrong. It's a big thing. Maybe you're going to go, man, I blew that one. But God is with me, and he will guide me, and he will continue to speak. And, and, and it's okay it's, it's not unspiritual for a faith-filled person to say, I think God is saying this. That's not a lack of faith. That's called human wisdom. I, I think maybe God is, that's humility. I'm, I, help me discern. I think maybe God is saying this. That, that, that looks more humble than saying, thus saith the Lord. It's like, now I've got to vote against you and God, you know, on this deal. Let's be humble. Let's be humble. Be humble with our steps of faith in response to what you think are the Holy Spirit's words to you. And I think we, we need this kind of plan for discerning if we have received a word from the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus himself defines a disciple as someone who hears what God says and acts in obedience. So we need to be listening. And we need to know how we're going to discern. Jesus defined disciples that way. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So again, God speaks. We all live like that. That's one of the reasons we pray. God lead, guide, inform, speak. And we listen. We've got to check that with the Bible. We've got to check that with wise, mature followers of Jesus and the elders are certainly representative of that here. We need to be humble and open to the idea that we might not be getting this completely right. And then you step out in faith when this message has been confirmed by Scripture and the wisdom of others. The Holy Spirit is God's promise of words. And so we should listen. The Holy Spirit will speak on behalf of Jesus to his followers to give us help and guidance. The promise of words, God speaks. There's another aspect to this work of God speaking to us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sometimes speaks to us to speak through us. And here's an example of that from the scriptures. I think it's probably, uh, it might be the foremost example given to us in, in the scriptures about this kind of thing happening. It's a, an example from the life of the Apostle Paul where a man named Agabus takes Paul's belt, ties his own hands and feet with it, and said to Paul and his friends this, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Speak through us. And the Bible calls that prophecy. As Pastor Dave distinguished last week, prophecy with a small p, prophecy, sometimes referred to as a word of knowledge.
Sometimes we, we just think of prophecy as this predicting of the future or proclaiming of the word of the Lord, and that's the kind of stuff that the Old Testament capital P prophets were doing, okay? But there is another use of the word in the Bible, small p, prophecy, that defines prophecy more like telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. And the teaching of the scriptures about this small p prophecy gives the impression that some people have a spiritual gift of being able to discern what God may be saying in this moment and to speak that out, this kind of prophecy, but also that the Holy Spirit could speak like that through any one of us at any time, telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. Sometimes we call that, again, a word from the Lord, or uh, the this, this Scripture uses the phrase, a word of knowledge. Now, it's important to... let's def- let's further clarify this. Uh, This kind of telling something that God brings to mind or is laid on our hearts never comes across kind of gifting that way. Nor does it imply that a person who might sense God wanting to say something, that they're more spiritual than anybody else, okay? That they have a closer connection to God than anybody else. The spiritual gifts are never talked about that way, ever. That'd be like thinking your pastor, because he preaches on Sunday, is closer to God than you. What a bunch of nonsense that is. That's not true. And so the same with this idea of of a prophetic word. And like I said a few moments ago in regard to helpful words of guidance the Holy Spirit gives us personally, it's best to operate in this prophetic arena with a great deal of humility and caution. When God brings something to our mind or lays something on our hearts for someone else, It may be, it may be the exact thing that they need to hear. hear. Maybe you've experienced that. I have. The key word is maybe, maybe. So it's best, again, to make sure that this lines up with scriptural truth, is affirmed by wise, mature people, by those elders, and then to say something like this. I think God may be saying this to us or to you. I think, I think, how does that sound to you? That's humility. It's not saying, thus saith the Lord, you shall marry, you know, it's like, man, I think God may be saying this, humility. God will speak to us to speak through us, but because this is a, is a pretty subjective thing, really. We can never regard those words with the same authority as we regard the Scriptures. Never, ever. And so let's be humble and and respectful and slow to assign messages to God when we're thinking maybe. Even Agabus, let's go back to this deal. This is very interesting. I think it's very interesting that this is one of these, one of, one of the clear examples of the Holy Spirit says thing. Let's look at what happens here. The Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. A prophetic word that Agabus thinks he's giving, a word from the Lord. Well, if you read later in the story in Acts chapter 21, we read that the Gentiles rescue Paul from the Jews who were trying to kill him. The Jews didn't hand him over. They wanted to strike him down dead, and the Romans had to intervene and pull him out of that mob. And it was the Gentile Romans who bound Paul, not with a belt, not with a rope, with chains. Read the story. Now, what does that tell us? The Holy Spirit knew what was in line for Paul and in store for Paul. And... So Agabus is getting some of it right. You're going away, Paul. (laughs) You're going to be arrested. But he isn't getting it all right. Even right there, the example in the Scripture for our benefit. Be humble. Do not despise prophesying. He's referring to this small letter P type ministry among God's people. Do not despise prophesying, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. And never give this word uh, 
the same authority that we would give to the scriptures. If Paul was regarding these words as scripture-like authority, he would never have said, do not despise this word. He wouldn't have had to say that. Paul wrote in an earlier note to the Thessalonians that they had received the word of God, which you had heard from us. You accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. He didn't say test that or don't despise that. He said, you know the word of God. You know it. You've accepted it. But this other thing, this prophesying, don't despise it, but weigh carefully. It seems obvious that the teaching of the apostles, the Bible inspired by the Holy Spirit, has one level of authority, and this word from the Lord, prophesying, word of knowledge thing, has, a, has another level. And God will speak to us for others. But it's necessary and expected that we test these messages and hold on to what is good. Test them with the Bible. Test them with the counsel of the elders and other mature, wise people. Test them with much prayer ourselves. And again, it seems that that is what is referred to in the Apostle Paul's letter to Jesus' followers at the city of Corinth, writing instructions about the variety of things that can happen when Jesus' followers gather together. Paul says, two or three prophets should speak, and others weigh carefully what is said. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Again, weigh carefully what is said. Sort through. Some of it may be from God and helpful. Some of it may be mixed in with a person's emotions or something else. And again, this kind of weighing carefully would never be suggested about the Scriptures, about the authority of the Word of God. To that we hear, obey, obey, not weigh carefully. But again, the words of prophecy, words of knowledge need to be discerned. Is this really from the Holy Spirit? If it, if it is, it'll be timely, it'll be instructive, it'll be encouraging, it'll be clearly biblical. But again, we must weigh these words because our own thoughts can easily get mixed in with what the Holy Spirit may be wanting to speak through us. And don't judge them. Don't condemn them as being not spiritual or not as spiritual as you are. If it's really a message from God, He's going to get it through to them. They'll hear. He loves them. So with humility, let's live in this world of God speaking to us. God speaks to us. The Holy Spirit may suddenly bring something 